Here are the letters the Romans gave us. And here are the countries whose languages derive from Latin. Today they cover half the world. As for the ancient Romans, the boundaries of their state encompassed their entire civilization. The Roman peace, or Pax Romana, serves as the first example of globalization. Let's take a walk across 12 centuries of the Roman history. And yes, those numerals are also a Roman legacy. What is Rome? A city on seven hills, capital of Italy. But that is today, and 2,000 years ago, there it is. Another thousand years ago, there. A tiny tribal settlement of the Latins by the river Tiber. How did this manage to conquer the world? First, it was lucky with its neighbors. To the north, the Etruscans of modern Tuscany. A mysterious people whose language has never been fully deciphered. To the south, Greek colonies. These peoples all traded with each other. It was at the crossroads of their trade routes that Rome appeared. From the very start, Rome has been an open city, a safe haven for outcasts, murderers, runaway slaves. Rome offered migrants a unique opportunity to become fully-fledged citizens. This will make Rome the largest metropolitan city of the ancient world. The Romans themselves believed they were descendants of refugees from the Middle East who had survived the Trojan War. Romulus and Remus were the great-grandchildren of the Trojan hero Aeneas. Nursed by an Italian she-wolf, the brothers quarreled where to site the future world capital. Romulus killed Remus, gave his name to the city, and became its first ruler. As legend has it, there were seven kings, each of which enjoyed a lengthy reign and left some beneficial legacy. A calendar, a sewer system, or the Capitolium, a temple to the senior god Jupiter. Much of what the Romans later became famous for, aqueducts, bridges, perhaps even the gladiatorial games, were borrowed from the Etruscans. This people had invented the Latin alphabet by adapting the Greek letters for their own needs. It's not surprising that their last kings were Etruscan. Rome borrowed her military and government organization from them, while maintaining her stern, patriarchal simplicity. In 509, Rome was shaken by a sex scandal. The son of King Tarquin the Proud raped the chaste Lucretia. Tarquin was expelled, making him the last king of Rome. The Romans decided to prevent any such concentration of power ever again. From 509 onwards, they elected two consuls to serve a year apiece, instead of a monarch. The consuls were controlled by the Senate. This consisted of 300 fathers, patris in Latin, hence the term patricians. Those not so lucky to be born into the right families joined the plebs. Even if they were as rich as patricians, they were not entitled to take up positions in the state. It is in the 200-year struggle for these rights that the Republic, literally meaning public thing, will be formed. The plebeians would make up the backbone of the army, and to have their own way, they would threaten the fledgling state with emigration to a neighboring hill. Each time, the scared patricians caved in, introducing, for instance, the special position of a representative or tribune of the plebeians. These had the right to veto any decisions of the consuls. One of the main achievements of the struggle was the publication of the first written laws. By 287 BC, the plebeians had achieved complete equality of rights with the patricians. The unity of Rome found its best expression in the formula Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and the Roman people, which still adorns the manhole covers in Rome. In 390 BC, the history of Rome could have come to an end. The city was unexpectedly taken by the Gauls. The guard dogs had sensed no danger, for which they would be crucified every year since. Geese awoke the last protectors of the Capitoline Hill fortress instead, saving Rome from complete destruction. The shaken Romans conducted a military reform. The Roman legion was divided into manipuli, making it more mobile in battle. The Roman army spent the next hundred years in constant wars. Instead of simply imposing a tribute on the conquered, the Romans would enter into a treaty of alliance with them, and the loyal allies supply Rome with a never-ending stream of recruits. 
Thanks to this, the Roman legions were able to stand their ground in battle with the most efficient fighting force of the time, the all-conquering Macedonian phalanx, led by Pyrrhus, a relative of Alexander the Great. The last stronghold of resistance in Italy, the Greek city of Tarentum, then hired the most costly and celebrated contemporary warlord of the time to defend against Roman expansion. Having conquered Tarentum and reached Sicily, Rome now had to take on a much more dangerous adversary, Carthage, Lord of the Mediterranean. The Romans called the Phoenicians of Carthage Punics, hence the Punic Wars. They were fought over the next hundred years. In 149 BC, Rome had taken the greater part of Punic territory and that of their allies, but after each defeat, the trading power of Carthage would rapidly recover. Senator Cato, the elder, began to finish every speech with the same refrain, Carthage must be destroyed, and so it was done. The city was wiped out, all of its population was enslaved, allegedly plowing salt into the earth as an eternal curse. Also in 146 BC, the Romans wiped out another city, Corinth, making Greece and Macedonia Roman provinces. Rome appropriated the colossal riches of the disintegrating empire of Alexander, but the patriarchal simplicity of Rome succumbed to the sophisticated Greek culture. Greek became, in effect, a second state language. The Roman nobility busied itself learning new words, hexameter, history, rhetoric. Cicero, the most famed orator of Rome, would come to model his speeches on those of the Greek Demosthenes. However, across this immense territory, full rights were only afforded to the Romans themselves. Even other Italians, the majority of the military, had no citizenship rights. These would demand equality, declare war, and win the right to take part in managing the state. This was a total game changer. While ancient Greece remained a collection of squabbling city-states, Rome gradually extended citizenship rights to the conquered, laying down the basis for an empire. Having conquered half the world, Rome fell victim to globalization. Cheap grain and an inflow of unpaid slave labor bankrupted the small farmers. These rushed into the cities and joined the ranks of the proletariat, those who have nothing to lose except their own offspring. At the same time, the rich grew a hundred times richer, having bought land from the ruined peasants for a song. Previously united, the Senate and the Roman people split into two hostile camps. The tribunes of the people, the Gracchi brothers, would try to reconcile them. They proposed granting excess public lands to the impoverished peasants and suggested free distributions of bread to the poor. The disgruntled senators decided to suppress the Gracchi movement by force, killing the brothers and several thousand of their allies. Rome was gripped by civil wars. Social mobility for the proletariat was offered by Gaius Marius, a popular general. He began enrolling the proletariat into the army with a promise of a grant of land at the end of service. This would make the legions personally devoted to their generals. In 49 BC, two outstanding generals fought over Rome. Gnaeus Pompeius had won the eastern provinces for Rome, including restless Judea, cleared the Mediterranean of piracy, defeated Spartacus' slave revolt, and justifiably added the title Great to his name. Gaius Julius Caesar had conquered Gaul. Nowadays, they would call it genocide. He butchered a million Gauls and enslaved as many more. He went on to defeat the Germans and then invaded Britain. According to the law, a general had to dismiss his legions before returning to Rome and in return have his moment of glory, a triumphal entry into the capital to the applause of the citizens. Caesar performed a hitherto unseen maneuver. He refused to submit to the Senate and having crossed the Italian border, the river Rubicon, marched his legions to Rome. It would take him several years to defeat Pompey the Great and his other rivals, pitting Roman legions against each other. In the process, Caesar annexed new territories and gave Cleopatra the Egyptian throne. After a romantic cruise along the Nile, she would give birth to Caesarion, or Little Caesar. On his return, Caesar would add Imperator, or Emperor, to his name, title originally meaning Victorious Commander and gain control of all political positions. 
Consul, Tribune of the People, and Dictator. Rumor spread that Caesar wanted to declare himself king. Conspiracy was brewing in the Senate, and Caesar was assassinated. Caesar left his wealth, quite unexpectedly for all concerned, to his grandnephew, 19-year-old Gaius Octavius. This Octavian immediately joined in the power struggle. In 31 BC, he defeated his last rival, the warlord Mark Antony, who likewise had an affair with Cleopatra. The lovers would take their own lives. Octavian was left sole ruler of a vast territory. Julius Caesar ruled for four years. Octavian, assuming the title Augustus, meaning the venerable or the great, ruled for an endless 43 years. He didn't formally abolish the Republic. He simply took control of all possible positions, making his power almost absolute. But he modestly called himself Princeps, the first senator. And even though skirmishes with barbarians continued along the borders, inside them, the period of Pax Romana set in, a period of peace and stability that was to last 200 years. The empire experienced an economic upswing. Bread was distributed for free to 200,000 people. On Augustus' orders, a 500-meter basin was dug at the very center of the capital, where 3,000 gladiators mimicked sea battles on real seagoing vessels. In Rome, construction was booming. Concrete and multi-story districts were growing. Augustus had to introduce height regulations, limiting skyscrapers to six floors. And still the citizens were unhappy. They complained about traffic jams, pollution of the waters of the Tiber, and high rents. The golden century of poetry dawned. Mycenas, a quasi-minister of culture, allocated special grants to praise the value of the state. Temples would be built in the honor of Augustus, and even a month was named after him. Thus, the cult of the Roman emperors was emerging. They would come to be venerated alongside Mars and Jupiter. After Augustus' power became hereditary, the senatorial opposition has left us vivid portraits of the first emperors. Suspicious Tiberius unleashed terror under the pretext of the law on treason. Under this law, any action could be deemed offensive. It was enough not to sufficiently praise the emperor or pay at a brothel with coins bearing his portrait. In distant Judea, a preacher refusing to worship the emperor as God was crucified. Caligula wanted to make his horse a consul. A scholar and gourmet, Claudius, was too occupied with feasting and the reforming of the alphabet to keep an eye on court intrigue. One of his wives, Messalina, was giving women of easy virtue a run for their money in the brothels. And the other, Agrippina, poisoned Claudius with mushrooms to enthrone her son from another marriage, Nero. Nero, believing that he was a born actor, not an emperor, would later kill his own mother, and then allegedly the apostles Peter and Paul. Then he again, allegedly, set fire to Rome, so as to read the verses on the fall of Troy during the blaze. He would accuse the first Christians of arson, and initiated their persecution. And finally, he took his own life. Most details of this era are known from Tacitus, a historian and senator who observed the degradation of Republican institutions. Fate of the empire was now decided not so much by the Senate as by the Praetorian Guards, the emperor's personal security force, created back in the times of Augustus. These suffocated Tiberius with a cushion, slayed Caligula by the sword, and hailed Claudius emperor. In all fairness, at the same time, the empire grew, expanding into new territories. Roman legions conquered part of Britain, where they founded a town called Londinium. Provinces were given a transparent taxation system, and the non-Roman nobility began to enter the Senate en masse. A grandchild of an Italian peasant, Vespasian Flavius would become the founder of the next dynasty. Vespasian and Titus, suppressing the uprising in Judea, committed genocide, again according to modern day, not Roman standards, and reduced the Temple of Jerusalem to nothing but the Wailing Wall. On a lighter note, Vespasian had a jolly good Roman predisposition. He taxed the collectors of urine at the public toilets. And Titus, the destroyer of Jerusalem, would nevertheless obtain the title of Merciful. After a splendid triumph, he opened the Colosseum for the people. Titus would be called the love and consolation of humankind. 
and after such festivities had depleted the public treasury, Vesuvius destroyed Pompeii, plague devastated half Italy, and Titus became a god. The second century would go down in history as the era of the good emperors. Trajan was considered by his contemporaries the best emperor ever. Rome became a million strong city and the empire reached its largest extent. Rome connected on new territories via a network of paved roads. This system still determines the transport map of Europe. After Trajan's conquest, Hadrian busied himself with defense, erecting massive fortifications in Britain and between the Rhine and the Danube. Pantheon was built in Rome, the first temple to be topped by a massive dome, a real architectural sensation of the day, dedicated to all the gods. Hadrian would also include his lover among them, the young Antinius. More of his images have survived than of any Roman. The last good emperor, the throned philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, would spend most of his reign on military expeditions. In between battles, he wrote his manifesto for Stoic philosophy, Meditations. It was under Marcus Aurelius' son, Commodus, that the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, came to an end. He preferred a gladiator's glory to the affairs of state. Conspirators had the emperor strangled by a fellow fighter, the slave Narcissus. Rome sank into chaos. The next hundred years brought a sequence of random emperors proclaimed by the army, taking their turn on the throne, were a liberated slave, a fortune seeker who bought the throne at an auction, general Punic descent who would place statues of the former enemy, Hannibal all over the empire, a Syrian priest of the sun, and a former shepherd who owed his popularity to his powerful physique. In 212, Emperor Caracalla, half North African, half Syrian, granted Roman citizenship to nearly all free subjects of the empire. The idea that you could be a Roman in Judea, in Africa, or any other corner of the empire at all might well be the main legacy of Rome still in use today. By mid-century, Rome was already in the midst of such a crisis that the whole provinces were starting to split off. The Gauls, for instance, proclaimed an empire of their own. Order would be restored by the son of a liberated slave, Diocletian. Having started his career as a soldier, he would end up an absolute monarch, an astonishing example of social mobility. Diocletian split the empire into four, with four co-rulers at four capitals, situated closer to the frontier. Rome lost its significance. The Senate became a town council. The country was now ruled by an army of officials personally reporting to the emperor. Thus, the ancient world, centered around the concept of a free community and free citizens, came to an end. From the princeps, the first senator, the emperor, had become the dominus, a title by which slaves addressed their masters. The citizen became a subject, the warrior turned into a soldier, and the farmer a semi-serf. Diocletian himself resigned from the post of emperor 20 years later and went off to his estate to grow cabbages. After Diocletian's departure, the co-rulers were fighting for power. Constantine, the future Saint Constantine the Great, emerging victorious. Before the crucial battle for Rome, he allegedly had a vision of a cross. After this, he made all religions equal. After 300 years of persecutions, the Christians came out of the catacombs and were now entitled to build churches alongside the temples of Augustus and Mars. Constantine would take the cross from Jerusalem to the new capital of the Roman Empire, Constantinople. Theodosius I would make Christianity the official religion and begin to destroy the ancient temples. He would also be the last emperor of a united Roman Empire. His sons split the empire into west and east. The eastern half would live another thousand years and is known to us as Byzantium. The western part would fall victim to the great migration of peoples. Rome, founded by migrants, would fall to the onslaught of a new wave of refugees. Ironically, the last ruler of Rome would be called Romulus. In modern Rome, not far from the Colosseum and the ruins of the Forum, there is a tomb. 
Its occupant was neither emperor nor senator, but a simple baker called Eurysakis. Likely born a slave into a family of Greek migrants, he later entered into a bread supply contract with the capital and became so rich that he could build such a monument for himself and his wife. Before Rome, in ancient Egypt and elsewhere, or after Rome, during the Middle Ages, a man would die in the same station in life as he had been born in. The life and career of Eurysakis is an answer to the question of how Rome was able to create a global state that lasted over a thousand years. Do you like our video? We have another one, this time about ancient Greece. Or you can watch the shortest history of Russian art of the 20th century. We've squeezed 100 years into just 25 minutes. And that is not all. Subscribe to the Azimuth channel and you'll be sure not to miss out on anything.